Hello, everyone. Um, I think this is the time that we we're scheduled for, so I'll just like to begin. Um, welcome to our final presentation of the day. I hope your morning's all been going well. My name is Anna Newsart, and I will be presenting on coffee and caffeine nutritional implications and how it can affect our health both positively and perhaps negatively. I'd like to all just remind you um, to please keep the questions till the end and then I will reach out to you and answer you as best as I can. So before I begin, I just wanna bring out a question to the audience. You can either put it into the chat or um, put on your microphone. How many of you had had a cup of coffee this morning? All right. <laughs> well, it looks like most of us had. I know what I did for sure. Um, how many of you wish you could have another cup right now? I know I could on this cold day. Um, but with all the coffee that we do consume, you would hope there's some sort of beneficial um, impact to it. But perhaps that's not always the case. So what I would like our minds to brew on during this presentation is how caffeine can impact both our health positively and negatively. So here are some of the objectives um, that we'll be going through today. Um, just want to look at briefly what coffee is and our uh, chemical composition of coffee, why I specifically chose caffeine, and what the research says about um, caffeine in our health. Then I'll just go over some summary points at the end, briefly describing some other research that I had found. So what is coffee? There's actually 90 different species of coffee, um, but the two that we are most familiar with are coffee arabica and coffee canifora, and, uh, or robusta as what we would call it. These are the most um, commercially produced and sold within the US, and henceforth a lot of the research is conducted studying these types of coffee. The chemical composition of these um, vary depending on species to species, as well as the roasting and drying process, um, the type of bean, and the temperature and the length of time that these um, green beans were produced to make the dry coffee beans. One study found that North America and Canada included actually had the highest caffeine containing beverage volume sales per capita. So we are ringing up at 348 liters of caffeinated containing beverages per capita. So that is quite a lot compared to a lot of the other countries. So for the chemical composition, it varies between species to species, but these are the main components of what the green coffee bean contains. However, during the chemical um, breakdown of the drying and roasting process, a lot of these are actually destroyed. Um, however, the caffeine itself is largely intact. It is between 1.3 and 2.4 grams per 100 grams of green coffee beans. Um, so that's one reason why I decided to look at caffeine specifically, because it is such a um, pivotal compound to coffee. And, has the largest volume contained um, compared to the other ones here. But one point I would like to mention to you, this last um, compass chemical listed here, the melanonins, is actually the compound that is responsible for bringing out that beautiful coffee um, color and flavor as well. So that's just a little interesting side note. So why caffeine? It is the most um, pharmacological substance within coffee and it can be 100% absorbed, meaning that when we consume coffee, almost all of it is absorbed directly into our GI tract instantly. It affects on our antagonists, um, or it acts as an antagonist to our adenosine receptors, A1, A2, and AB2. 
A lot of neurodegenerative diseases also affect these receptors. Um, so it plays a role in how it affects those diseases from developing. So I'll just mention that a little bit later in this presentation. And as a side note, the US guidelines recommend three to five cups of coffee per day um, as to follow. Not necessarily that you need coffee, but it's just saying that this is what it's recommending, um, which is about 400 milligrams of caffeine per day. And as there has been multiple studies and research conducted on caffeine because it is so prevalent, there is a lot of the studies that show positive and negative effects. So before we dive into the research, um, I just wanted to look into some lesser known research articles that you may not know about and kind of show you both the positive and negative things that caffeine can do. So these are some areas that specifically coffee works on our body. But the highlighted ones show areas that caffeine from coffee directly impact, whether it's positive or negative. So the research that I will be showing you, I'm going to focus on cancer, um, the metabolism, and um, the neurological type effects. So caffeine and cancer. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard that there has been studies shown that um, cancer risk is decreased with caffeine intake. And this is true. A lot of studies have proved this. Um, and the studies or the, the types of cancer listed here are ones that are specifically affected by caffeine. So that's a colorectal, a breast, prostate, and a couple more that I didn't list. But um, yeah, there's quite a lot that is actually affected specifically by caffeine, but this led me to question why are not other cancers list listed here? Why are these only affected by caffeine and what are the reasons behind other cancers are not linked to this? So this brings me to my first research article. Looking at the association between coffee, green tea, and caffeine intake and its effects of liver cancer. This article was a cohort study um, conducted in Japan on both men and women and resulted in about 30,000 participants. They were analyzed based on their coffee and tea consumption and the prevalence of liver cancer risk or disease being developed during this follow-up period. Those who were included had to be greater than or equal to 35 years old and were non-hospitalized. Patients who had a medical history of cancer or were diagnosed with liver cancer before the baseline survey was conducted were excluded. Here's just a little breakdown of what the researchers found. Um, those participants who drank two coffee cups per day actually had a decreased risk of liver cancer. However, I know those percentages are quite small compared to the total population, um, but it was still statistically significant. Then the researchers looked at specifically caffeine intake and its total consumption, not only from caffeine, from coffee, but also green and black tea. So those who drank about 115 to 245 milligrams also had a decreased risk. But as you can see, it's not as low as the coffee intake percentage. So this led the researchers to presume that there was something else in the coffee that were leading to these decreased risks and not necessarily the caffeine effect. So in the end of the 30,000 participants, only 172 actually developed liver cancer, which I thought was quite surprising because it was a pretty big population. And the risks of liver cancer were no different in both men and women. It was found that higher consumption of coffee was associated with decreased liver cancer risk. However, the researchers concluded that chorogenic acid may be responsible for this and not caffeine specifically. This can also be seen because green, black tea and caffeine intake were not associated with decreased risks. Additionally, decaf calf coffee slightly decreased the risk. So there is no caffeine, well, a little bit of caffeine in that, but 
Um, that's another reason why the researchers thought that there was something else within the coffee itself that were leading to these results. Some strengths of the study, it was a high participation rate and a very um, long follow-up periods. And it was a perspective design. I couldn't find a whole lot of limitations with it other than the hepatic um, disease participants were not excluded. So this could lead to a little bit larger um, room for liver disease to develop. So now that I know just a tiny bit more of caffeine and its effects on its body, I like to bring your attention to a somewhat recent article per published by the ADA that looked at the association between coffee and caffeine intake and Parkinson's disease. So unlike that last article, this research article specifically looks on caffeine and how it interacts with Parkinson's. It's um, trying to limit other nutrients in coffee to specifically prove that caffeine is the reason that there is a decreased risk. So with this study, they were looking at the association of both coffee and caffeine and Parkinson's disease. It was a longitudinal study conducted on participants who were part of the Honolulu Heart Program and had a 30-year follow-up period. The um, participants were followed over six years to gather the data for um, Parkinson's disease and total caffeine and coffee intake, but then they were followed the 30 years after just to see what would happen um, and if their caffeine did significantly reduce Parkinson's disease. Those who were included were older Japanese men from 45 to 68 years old from the Honolulu Heart Program living in Hawaii. So they were Japanese American. Um, in the end, there was about 8,000 participants. Those who were excluded were either diagnosed with Parkinson's before the baseline survey or also had other neurogenitive diseases that were similar. Um, so they were excluded from analysis. Here's a little breakdown of the results. Uh, it was found that people who drink 80 or 28 ounces of coffee per day actually had about a five times percent um, decrease of having Parkinson's. So that's about 3.5 cups of coffee, which may seem quite a lot to you, but now with those big large coffee mugs that some of us may have, we probably drink close to that um, without even knowing it. Another really interesting thing was that non-coffee drinkers had a two to three higher risk for developing Parkinson's compared to those who drink even just four to eight ounces of coffee. In the end, 102 men developed Parkinson's, which also is a quite low risk out of the 8,000 men. Coffee drinkers were shown to have a statistically significant lower risk of developing Parkinson's and non-drinkers were two to three times higher um, for developing Parkinson's compared to those who drank just a little bit of coffee. The researchers also looked at the other chemical compounds within coffee and found that neither of them had association between risk of Parkinson's. So they specifically proved that caffeine um, within coffee helped reduce Parkinson's. And that could be because both the disease and the caffeine affect the adenosine receptors. Um, so there could be a link between this. Some strengths of the study, it was an extended follow-up period and had quite a large population. However, it was limited to this population because um, it was only men living in Hawaii who were Japanese American. So it's quite specific and I don't think it's really relatable to the rest of the population. And it was an observational study, so there could have been room for error um, just with how the people were reporting their information. So now I'm just going to switch a little bit of directions to our next um, research article. I'm assuming that when you guys had your cup of coffee, you weren't all grumbly and complaining about it, but probably made you feel warm and cozy and maybe a little bit happier about today. 
Um, so this research article looks at how caffeine affects our nervous system and its effects on a behavior, specifically looking at depressive symptoms and caffeine intake. So this was a logistic um, regression cross-sectional study. Um, it was conducted on participants who completed the 2005 to 2006 and Haynes survey. They must have been greater than or equal to 18 years old. And the participants were then split into four quartiles based on their coffee and caffeine consumption. Then they used the PHQ scale to determine the severity of depressive symptoms that people had reported. Again, those who completed the NHANES survey were um, used for the data collection, and they must have reported questions both in the diet and depressive symptoms category. If they only answered one of these categories, they weren't in included. 400 or 4,000 participants, almost 5,000 participants were included in the end. And in the results, they did find in a significant inverse association between coffee and depressive symptoms. There were a large number of variables that were adjusted for to find this result. However, there are 11 different variables that were adjusted for, which kind of leads me to think perhaps this was more of a bias survey. Um, personally, I feel like if you're just going to keep adjusting for things, I think you're going to run into finding an association eventually. So this kind of leads me to feel that perhaps this wasn't the most um, accurate study. That is why there's also many conflicting research um, results. There is quite a lot of studies that do prove the association between caffeine and decreased depression, but there's also um, a few studies showing that um, there is a flip-flop of this. So in one study, children who were between 9 and 12 who had um, consumed caffeine and coffee actually had a higher risk for depression. So that was just quite interesting to me. However, the researchers also pointed out that caffeine um, released serotonin and dopamine similar to the way antidepressant drugs work. So that could be a reason why there is some sort of association in this area. Some strengths uh, was a large sample size, and I think it would really quite accurately represents the US adults. A large population of people um, will put their questions into the survey. So I think that it could be somewhat accurate to the US population. Co-founders were adjusted for to ensure an association as well. However, it was a cross-sectional study, so that doesn't necessarily mean cause and effect. And there could have been measurement errors in how the people were reporting. The pHQ um, scale doesn't necessarily diagnose someone with depression. It is mostly accurate, but I think if a health professional used this study, they may have included more participants who um, had depressive symptoms because the researchers only use those who had a rating of 10 or of 10 or higher. The caffeine intake was also based on files from the nutrient analysis and not necessarily with labs like conducting um, blood and seeing what the caffeine levels were through that way. And there was a lack of specificity. The quartiles that the participants were split up into didn't necessarily say how much caffeine and coffee they consumed. So I don't know how much they actually drank to find these effects. If it was a little bit or if it was 3.5 cups. So now after looking at only three very specific studies, it's still difficult to understand if this impact on caffeine is beneficial or detrimental. So I just wanna go over those five areas that I mentioned earlier and just briefly go over what the research actually tells us. So for cancer, as we know and learned about before, there's a couple areas of um, cancer that can be decreased because of caffeine intake. Another study showed that caffeine may affect uh, 
carcinogenesis by reducing the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are produced during chronic inflammation of cancer development. And they found this was correlated to drinking three to four cups of coffee per day, which is equal to about 60 to 85 milligrams per cup. There also is some recent studies showing caffeine-assisted chemotherapy that they may be starting to use, but it's still in the works, so that is quite, um, needs more research to be understood. Cardiovascular disease is quite controversial in the caffeine world. Um, there's been studies to show both positive and negative effects, but um, I feel like there's more, more negative effects, but it also differs person to person. One example of this is fetal heart development. So while many doctors encourage pregnant women to minimize or reduce caffeine intake while pregnant, is because the half-life of caffeine actually almost triples um, through having the baby. So normally it's three to six hours of half-life for caffeine. So that means it takes about that long for it to go through your system. Um, but then when you're pregnant, it also goes up to 10 to 20 hours. And after crossing through into the baby, this can go up to 80 hours for the half-life to be reduced because the baby's detoxification system is not fully developed. So this can lead to fetal heart development. Another effect shows that cardiovascular disease is actually increased because of caffeine intake. Studies have shown that um, drinking five or more cups of coffee can increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. It can also have effects on cardiac arrhythmias, heart rate, increased cholesterol, and hypertension. However, they um, have also found that this is correlated between the um, amount of coffee you drink, whether you're a habitual or occasional coffee drinker, the time of day, the frequency, and what medications or nut other nutrients you took in while drinking coffee. And lastly, the cardiovascular stress test is also inhibited by caffeine. So that is why many doctors choose to limit caffeine in coffee 12 hours before the stress test is being conducted because they have been found out of six out of eight participants produce a negative false test if they have caffeine in their system. So that's not good, and we want to make sure we're giving people the accurate results. Now, with the nervous system and behavior, it may seem slightly common sense. We all know when we have that cup of coffee during work, it helps us to stay focused a little bit more. So it can improve our cognitive um, performance. Also, as seen in the research article, there has been links to increase um, happiness and slightly decreasing our depressive symptoms. Again, there's side effects to this though, which include tachycardia, headaches, insomnia, uh, tremor, and a couple others as well, which is all dependent on the person to person and how your metabolism reacts to it. Caffeine and diabetes is very interesting to me. They basically have a um, flip-flop effect. So if you're a chronic coffee drinker like me, um, there is mostly a decreased risk of many diabetes um, risk factors. There is an overall decreased risk of developing type 2, increased, decreased risk of insulin resistance, and even hypertension. However, if you drink coffee occasionally, there is more risk for developing cardiovascular, arterial blood pressure, and insulin resistance. This is because um, the caffeine is not as regulated when you are an acute drinker. Hypertension is determined by um, who may or may not be a habitual drinker. But even those who do drink coffee quite a lot may never fully have tolerance to caffeine's um, interactions. So even those who consume a lot of coffee may still have a slightly higher blood pressure compared to those whose body can metabolize it better. Again, this is due to the plasma, basal plasma caffeine concentration and person to person. And lastly, um, how caffeine works on metabolism and our organ systems. 
It inhibits our adenosine receptors, which Parkinson's disease also works on. So this can be used as an anti-Parkinson's disease um, type of way to help that. There's also been studies to show that there's an antioxidant activity with coffee, including to decrease risk of dementia and other neurogenitive diseases as well. So in summary, I think it's safe to say that there's a wider range of coffee, both in positive and negative effects. Some of the positive things we had found that it decreases risk of depression, um, decreases some risk of diabetes as well as cancer risk. However, much more research needs to be studied in order to look into this a little bit deeper. I encourage you all to look into the research and into your personal life and see whether or not that cup of coffee is benefit, benefiting you or maybe hindering you a little bit. But as for me, I think I'll just grab myself another cup. Thank you all for listening. And these are just some of my resources. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or through your microphone. Otherwise, um, one of the moderators will probably wrap it up here in a few minutes. Yeah, great job, Anna. So yeah, like she said, anybody who has questions, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand and we can call on you so you can unmute your mic. And then when all the questions are answered or no one has any more, I'll get into the closing remarks. All right, well, if nobody has any questions, I guess I'll wrap it up. My name is Elena Mazurkowitz. I am the other co-lead of the leadership team. And on behalf of my team, I would just like to express my appreciation to everybody today who has joined us. I know that virtual conferences are not as fun as being in person. And um, I hope that someday we'll be able to meet face to face again. Thank you to all the interns for their wonderful presentations today. You guys all did a wonderful job. If you have not already, please fill out the survey for each presentation you attended today. And, and then also I'll be sending over a post event survey. And so I'm sending over the link right now. And then we really appreciate any of the feedback. If anybody has any added questions or any comments that they would like to make to anybody, please feel free to put that in right now. Okay, that is the link for the post-evaluation one. But if nobody has anything else to say, I would just like to conclude our event today. I hope that you all enjoyed and I hope you all have a great rest of your day and happy holidays to everybody.